Hello there, everybody. It's Mike Yao with Savage Kingdoms Role Playing Game, Fire Night Productions. So, I haven't done a video in uh, about two or three weeks, so I thought I would do another one. And uh, this video, as you might can see down in the title, is about uh, gaming economy, about how to use uh, treasure and how to spend gold and silver and coins and money like that. And so, how does it apply in a tabletop RPG? So, not only in a Savage Kingdom sense, which is uh, my game or Red Sun. Uh, but in Dungeons and Dragons, which is far more far more known, um, and other medieval fantasy tabletop uh, games, and this could apply to old west games, or probably even more so in some degree, um, science fiction that might use credits, anything that really has an economy and a monetary system, and so how that would work, kind of applying it in sort of semi-realistic terms to a uh, tabletop role-playing setting. But also, like in a more game mechanic sense, like what what can you do with it? Because this subject comes up a lot for some reason. I think in the early days of gaming, um, treasure, as we called it, you know, gaining treasure, our treasure. So when you found treasure items, a lot of it was coinage. And uh, I think a lot of gamers nowadays don't necessarily know what to do with that. They're like, oh, this is great. I found a golden idol worth 100 gold pieces. That, great. That's awesome. What do I do with it? Um, so in the early days of Dungeons & Dragons, when it was just mostly dungeons and in between dungeon exploration and you know, adventures, basically, or, or just game sessions, you often would go to the surface and you would go by the nearby town, which I don't know why I'm doing this, because it wasn't typically fleshed out in the very early days, like in the late 70s going into the maybe the very early 80s. Um, it was just kind of a generic town, and you know the dungeon master might describe a little bit of it, uh, of it but you would expect your basic medieval uh, things there, right? You would have a tavern and maybe an inn if it were a large enough village or town. Uh, there might be a temple or two to certain deities or whatever. Um, and you might have a merchant, and you probably would have a marketplace or a bazaar that might, or at least a town square where some of the local minor merchants and traders and vendors and hawkers would come out and to sell their wares. So, and basically, if that wasn't even described, it was just you looked at the, what resembled a player's handbook in that time, which there's like usually just a page or two of equipment on it, and you would just take your money and just, the game master would be like, all right, what do you, uh, what do you guys want to do your money with your money? You can buy these items, and it would be on the sheet of paper inside the, the rule book or just, or whatever. And it would be, back in the old days, maybe only like 50 different items on there. And so I, I recall, um, like the biggest thing you wanted, particularly as a warrior class, a fighter or something, was like, was plate mail, uh, plate mail, or even chain mail. You usually couldn't really start with it back then. Maybe, but that might have been all you had. Um, so when you came out of the dungeon, quote unquote, you wanted to buy the best armor. You wanted to, to, to get chain mail in the very least. And if, if you could, plate armor, which cost a, a lot, you have to had to go through several adventures to gain enough money and survive in order to buy plate armor so that you could survive better because your armor class would get lower because that's how it worked in the old days. The lower armor class was the better. Um, yeah, it was weird. Uh, actually, at the time, that was all we had, so it wasn't weird at all. But now, with the uh, ascending number systems that most game systems have, it doesn't make as much sense. But there was a reason for it, but that's for another video. And you guys might already know about it, all that anyway. Game history. So anyway, I'm going to break down some things about how to apply money and treasure items and gemstones and jewelry and all that stuff that equates to coinage and trade items and trade and barter and all that stuff and try to break some of it down. Uh, like in past videos, I, I like to try to do this thing where I, I'm breaking it and I'm giving you some game mechanic-y stuff-ish. I'm also kind of tying it to a little bit of historical. I, I, I prefer a good bit of medieval history or at least influence or inspiration in to my games. It's called medieval fantasy for a reason. Some people just call it fantasy and that's fine. Uh, but I like to let people know that it is uh, particularly now Savage Kingdoms is more of a dark ages setting, sort of pre-medieval. Um, and Red Sun is more of an, an ancient world, an antiquated age. So even pre-dark ages. Uh, however, medieval fantasy is just kind of a generic term when you're dealing with uh, a lot of the tropes of such. So, all right. So starting with, um, I just kind of wrote down a couple of little categories here. Um, so I'm going to start with treasure. Um, I kind of went over a little bit there. So what does treasure mean? So treasure in the adventuring sense of the world is, uh, or the term is that you you slay a dragon, you know, put it in the more generic trope. You slay a dragon, the dragon has a 
uh, hoard in his lair, a hoard of coins, because dragons tend to hoard um, treasure because it makes them feel powerful and they're very greedy, typically in t most dragon lore. Uh, and so you would gain its its treasure if you wanted it, and most people did. So you would um, bag up the copper pieces and the silver pieces, and if you were lucky, the gold pieces, and or if you're really lucky, platinum, which really didn't come around until second edition D&D, or the funky stuff that's the electrum pieces. But anyway, you would bag up whatever coinage there was, gemstones, um, could be a jeweled goblet, could be some um, nice weapon or two, or a, a, sh a shield or some other armor item. Whatever it is, treasure is the generic term, and you would bag it and get back to said town that I talked about a few minutes ago, and typically, and you already kind of knew what to do with that treasure, you typically would spend it on new equipment to make yourself better. You would buy a, oh, I, I want a great sword now, I couldn't afford that starting off, or I want, like I said earlier, the chain mail or the plate, plate armor, I want a better shield. Um, and back in the early days, it was... That was kind of all you had. There wasn't like, like in Savage Kingdoms, I have um, item quality categories, exceptional, master crafted, and then eventually, and possibly for fortunate, even heroic quality, or if you're really fortunate, legendary um, quality. So um, so in Savage Kingdoms, you could come out of the, quote, dungeon, unquote, or out of an adventure, uh, gaining some, some coin, and you could buy like a better dagger or a better spear or a better crossbow or whatever um you buy the exceptional quality whatever if you can afford it master craft it so back in the old days it literally was just it was a dagger or a short sword or a spear or a quarter staff or whatever a mace or something so anyway it was already kind of built in what you wanted to buy so you came out of the dungeon you bought new stuff that's typically what you did with your coin i don't recall us doing much more with it um and knowing a lot of other order gamers that have been around there wasn't like too much as we got more into the role playing and the game developed and um, and went more into second edition, we got more creative. Uh, the game also got more creative in general, and uh, we were doing more like stuff that you would read in fantasy novels. We might go to the tavern and carouse a little bit, spend some money, gamble, spend coin to get NPCs to talk and give us information and rumors and stuff like that, or to bribe the guards or something like that. So just remember that's a good use of coins is stuff like that. It's not just about buying stuff that's great and all, buying better equipment, but also you can use it to bribe uh, anybody, priest or, you know, the, the typical trope is bribing the city guard so you can enter the gates after they've closed at night or to uh, not be arrested or whatever the case may be. Uh, so just be creative with those uh, coins. I feel like... Um, Again, I think in modern gaming, some people just not quite sure what to do with money. I believe a lot of the thoughts, this is kind of a problem with high fantasy in general, is people think in magic item terms. So they ignore all the mundane equipment, which can be countless things that you could buy that's really cool and you could be really clever with stuff. Some of the most memorable adventurers I can remember is somebody using a mundane piece of equipment, like a piece of rope or an iron spike or, or uh, their belt. I remember a couple of player characters didn't have any rope and they took their belts and leather belts and tied them together and made like a 15 foot uh, rope out of it basically to lower themselves down. So you could do some creative stuff with a quid. It doesn't always have to be magical or even like high quality mundane stuff necessarily. So uh, the more you think beyond the obvious, like buying a magic item, which is basically a rare thing anyway, uh, there's a lot of different things you can do with, with just coins and as well as any other type of treasure. So if you get uh, gemstones are, and I'm just going to go into a subcategory of treasure. So now I'm going to talk about gems, gems and jewelry. We'll just kind of put that all in one category. So the way it typically works, and, and I, I typically dungeon master a, a lot for youth players. I have youth Dungeon Dragons players. I run summer camps and I run weekend games for them, and they're awesome. I love it. Um, but sometimes they struggle a little bit because, you know, they're younger. They haven't been exposed to the, to the world quite as much. So if they find a gemstone, which I describe being worth probably approximately 50 gold pieces, and they go to try to sell it or trade it, you know, whatever, they expect 50 gold pieces back. And that rarely happens unless they roll like a, they're haggling uh, and they're role playing it really well. And then on top of that, they roll like a 25 on persuasion or intimidation or deception, however they want, are approaching it. I might then they might get the full amount. Uh, but I think they they need to learn that. So just because the gem is worth 50 gold pieces, it's First of all, you got to find somebody that has 50 gold pieces and wants it that badly. And if they do, 
they're not going to make any profit off of it. So the only reason somebody would pay the full value of the gemstone is if that person just really wanted it and probably was going to keep it to themselves or give it to their their mate for the special anniversary date or something like that. Uh, probably wouldn't resell it because they're not going to really get any extra money for it unless they really are able to con or dupe somebody else, right? So just remember, just because a gemstone is worth 50 or 100 or even 500, very rarely are you going to get the full price. If you do, awesome. Be some good role-playing stuff. And that could produce role-playing stuff, the haggling and stuff. I know it's probably overdone occasionally, but if it's role-played out really well, uh, it could be, they could be memorable scenes. I wouldn't drag it out too long, but, you know, a couple minutes back and forth, it's kind of fun. And you could always support it with a, um, a skill check, for example, in Dungeons & Dragons, like I just mentioned, actually, deception. All your, your charisma kind of skills, uh, your social skills, so deception, persuasion, intimidation, uh, and that kind of stuff. But be careful because certain NPCs, they don't, they don't want you, if you try to intimidate them, they might react poorly. They may have some bodyguards with them or they may call for the town guard if you fail or even if you succeed. If you succeed, they might be intimidated for the moment and give you what you need, but you might get trailed down the rest of the city, which can produce really cool adventures, but can also get you in trouble and with your character, so, uh, yeah, so consider all of that. So, yeah, gems and jewelry, I would say jewelry is in kind of the same category. In fact, in some of the old D&D character sheets, it would say gems slash jewelry on the same line in your, like, treasure section of the character sheet. Because it's kind of the same, it's kind of a similar thing, uh, other than describing it and stuff. Although there can be enchanted jewelry items, right? In fact, there can be enchanted gemstones. I like doing those a lot, actually. Um... So just because you find a gem or a piece of jewelry, a necklace, a ring, doesn't necessarily mean it's it could be a magical item. So, you know, always remember to use your detect magic spells if you know them. Or at the very least, uh, an arcana check in D&D. Um, even though the skill doesn't necessarily say that you... But the in third edition, using arcana did... Uh, if you rolled high enough, you could at least tell if an item is enchanted, although it wouldn't tell you what it did. Obviously, that would be more in the realm of identify. Or you could puzzle out with a tech magic, knowing like the the school of magic that it falls within. So all that stuff, remember, right? It could be fun. So treasure, yeah, um, jewelry, gems. So if you find a, a coronet worth a thousand gold pieces, you know, a coronet, a crown, um, small crown, you could sell it. Uh, again, you would have to find a buyer that has a thousand gold pieces. You might get lucky if somebody wants to buy it for five hundred. You might have to find what's called a find what's called a fence which is typically a roguish individual who's, uh, I think, smuggler. If you're not familiar with the term fence, it's someone who would fence an item, meaning that they would, um, they're usually kind of shady. They would they would buy an item, usually not very good price. Like maybe you would get 30% of the price. But the cool thing about that person is that they will buy almost anything. The drawback is you're not going to get that great of a price because they have to resell it. And a lot of the times it's stolen stuff. They don't really care. And so they have to be really careful about how it gets traced and like who the buyer is. They have to trust the buyer so the buyer doesn't narc on them and all that kind of stuff. Um, which sounds ridiculous and like a lot of detail and like why, Mr. Mike, are you telling me this? Because there's some really good role-playing stuff in there. All this, uh, all these little things can produce stories, storylines, uh, which can be a lot of fun. Um, think about an item that gets found, a coronet that gets found and it's appraised to be worth a thousand gold pieces or in as Savage Kingdom's terms it would be a thousand silver it's a silver based economy um, or a hundred gold so who did the coronet belong to? if it's an item that expensive it's probably an heirloom item from a noble family or at least a very otherwise influential person like a, a very well uh, connected high priest uh, of the local religion or possibly a very wealthy merchant family um but not quite upper class but they're almost there they're almost if there is a medieval medieval class which there kind of was in the later middle ages um it would be merchants and wealthy merchants uh and even priests kind of fit in there they were kind of outside the social system but also part of it at the, yeah, it's weird but it's fun. By weird, I don't mean like blow it off. It's actually really cool to research it and to come up with your own interpretations of it for your individual fantasy settings. So yeah, so gems and gemstones, coins can be used to buy things. Oh, going back to coins, this is a fun little fun little fact. Most of you probably know this. So a lot of coins weren't necessarily accepted. Say, let's use real world, world terms. Say in 
1376 France and you had an English coin, there might be certain merchants, in fact there were, that would refuse to use English or uh, uh, coinage just because you know they were at war for, with each other for a long time. That's just one example. There's other, tons of other ex real life examples. Um, so that can be kind of fun. Like somebody finds coins, the, the game master, which I like to do some. I try not to do too much because I feel like a lot of my players don't really care, but some of them do. Um, like describing what the coin, like what nation or what realm or what kingdom minted that coin, if any. Maybe it's some rare thing that nobody knows, and that's a good reason for your history skill checks and uh, or a Savage Kingdom's uh, lore skill check, stuff like that. Uh, so just keep that in mind for storytelling. It's really cool that certain coins are not always accepted in certain realms. So that could be fun. It can get a little bogged down if you do it all the time, and you know that might get a little annoying. Uh, but again, put that in your storytelling book of things that you can use that Mr. Mike said might be cool. And, you know, maybe 48% chance it would actually be cool. Hopefully it's higher than that. So, <laughs> yeah, so certain coins can be certain realms are not ex uh, accepting of certain other realms as coins, either because there's like a uh, enmity between the two. Maybe they're at full scale war. Another thing, the cool thing to do, give you an example in my Savage Kingdom setting, uh, the noble Malovian nobles tend to hoard, there's a kingdom called Malovia, also known as the Winter Kingdom. The nobles tend to hoard all the silver that comes into the realm uh, because they like to make silver weapons out of them to defend themselves against the uh, lycanthropes and vampires and other sort of supernatural beings that tend to overrun that realm, or at least the commoners assume that's, that it's being overrun. It's not quite as much as they think, but it is to a degree. So... The point being is that if you have silver as a player character or even as an NPC merchant and you come into Melovia, you are armed, you're prepared, you, you know that this silver, you're going to get something for the silver and probably pay it pretty well um, because it is coveted by the nobility. Um, the common people are probably not going to want to buy it, they can't really afford it, and they know that if they hoard too much silver uh, and the local noble finds out, they can get in serious trouble, have it in the very least confiscated and probably worse done to them. The drawback is to that is that, and this is economy 101, and you all probably know this anyway, but I'm going to say it in case you don't. Uh, you can also, you can also be over perpetuate um, uh, uh, your an economy. So if going on that example where silver is being brought into Melovia, so suddenly a dozen merchants hear about, oh, they found this. Uh, silver uh, mine or something and they've made a deal with the miners and whoever's minting coins or maybe this just pure silver ingots that they're going to sell and they decide they're going to travel into Malovia and flood the markets with the silver. So if all of these merchants are doing that roughly at the same time or at least within maybe a few weeks of each other, so now suddenly the markets and now there's too much silver, right? And you're not going to get much for it, if any. Uh, probably not necessarily even true as Malovia, but some other areas just may not really have a need for it, um, or it may not be as valued. So in game terms, we say that in Savage Kingdoms and in D&D, &D, because I do it the same in um, SK, uh, except for it's a silver-based kind of set of gold, uh, it's a 10, 10 to 1 ratio, just because the math is easier there. Um, but, you know, you could do things like 10, maybe 15 silver pieces equal to gold in this one area. Again, it can get a little tweaky and detail-y, um, but it can be fun. And again, more storytelling options, which is a point, right? This is what this is kind of all about, right? So um, 10 copper equals a silver, same in D&D &D and SK. Again, maybe maybe there's, maybe the copper in this one realm, uh, this one mine is like amazing quality. So maybe eight of them are worth a silver piece or seven, you know, who knows? Um, again, that might be a little too deep, detailish. And don't hesitate to come up with other types of coins. Going back to my Malovian uh, um, um, example, so there there used to be iron coins, so even 10 of those equal one copper or bronze piece. So those are, we rarely find them anymore. They're kind of like in the current sort of default timeline of Savage Kingdoms. They're hardly really used at all, but it's kind of fun to, to find them every so often because the PCs are like, what the heck is iron coins? Um, and, but if they're cold iron, they might have some value against fey creatures having with their cold iron. So yeah, so don't you know easily discount everything. It might be useful. Um, or you could come up with other ways, like certain in real life. Sometimes in some of the ancient cultures, amber was traded because um, there it's almost like a gemstone. But you know, obviously it's it's prehistoric, dry, hardened sap. 
Uh, but it is considered a gem in the grand scheme of things. Um, or they might have traded glass, uh, glass beads or uh, stuff like that. So it's not necessarily always disc-shaped coins that are being traded. And also in real history, too, they're like the Chinese. In fact, some Chinese coins are still that way. They're, they were octagon, octagonal shaped with holes in them. Some were round with holes in the middle. The reason they put holes in the middle, and it wasn't just the Chinese. Some of the uh, Romans and Greeks did this as well, is they would often wear the coins on necklaces, particularly nobles. You think that seems ridiculous, right? You're, you're just asking to get robbed. Um, but you're also kind of being, you know, like, cool. You're like, hey, check it out. I've got the, like, obvious wealth. It wasn't even, like, jewelry is like literally coins that they would wear uh and it wasn't necessarily just for showing off sometimes it's just for ease like just you know you take the coin off an equivalent to that say to go to the, like the viking cultures like the northern european cultures um they would use the scandinavians that vikings particularly would use these uh things called hack silver they were silver armbands and they would literally hack a piece of silver off the armband and pay for that so it's equivalent of paying for with silver coins uh, if the if the so the coin is being pure silver, and it's presumably the hack silver bracelet is pure silver, then it's really the same quality. It doesn't matter if it comes in a token disc or if it's a, just a chunk of silver. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's all about the material. Most of the time, there, there might be some cultures who value the, the way something is shaped more than, than, than something else. But, and raw silver form, you, can, you, know, you could easily find a smith or even do it yourself. Uh, it is a pliable metal and kind of melt it down and shape it how you need it to be. So, again, more storytelling options and more details for world building right there. So, yeah. So, not everything specifically has to be a coin. Um, all right. So, I think I've beat the horse dead enough on, on, like, coins and gems and jewels and, like, what to do with them. Buying power. So, I'm going to move on to merchants so, or merchant craft. So, this is how merchants or merchant craft fits into a medieval fantasy setting or really any kind of setting but i'm going to use stay with medieval fantasy as kind of the default um so merchants were uh, or traders uh t-r-a-d-e-r -E not traitors but traders uh because they traded stuff right uh or merchants they were um kind of i mean they go way back they go back to antiquity and they were just at first they were just people it wasn't like their own class so to speak they were typically would be nobles because they would have more resources to get stuff but uh but even commoners eventually would if they would go, I mean, they would go and find a field of flint, for example, and then go trade it for something else with another tribe or another individual. So that's kind of where it first started. It's just very basic trade. So don't let the whole idea of merchants and merchant craft overcomplicate you with stuff. Because, you know, in the modern day, we are in kind of a little bit more of a confusing monetary system. Um, a lot of it's very digital. A lot of it's smoke and mirrors. The, the gold or the coins aren't really there anymore, except when you're using cash. And even then, they're really just registry notes and tokens for the most part. Um, it really comes down to what someone has and what someone needs uh, and just trading that back and forth. So instead of, instead of looking at buying and spending, you can almost use the term trade. Trade works for everything. If you're if you're buying something for 10 gold pieces, you're still trading 10 gold pieces for that item, right? So in a rear, in a more raw form of trading, like traded barter is what it would be called, you're bartering for something. So that would be like, I have these three fish I just caught in the nearby lake, and I will trade you the three fish for the rabbit fur. And that might be like, you know, maybe the guy with the rabbit fur is like, hmm, I don't know about that. I'm a full fish. All right, full fish for the rabbit fur. So be it. And so they would make a trade that way. And this is eventually, over time, how prices sort of got set. I say this in quotes because markets are fluctuating depending on supply and demand, right? So eventually, over time, it might be become known that uh, three fish is worth, worth a rabbit skin, um, or a deer antler is worth uh, half a, a, a piglet or something. Um, and so, as, and speaking of which, don't laugh, so animals were often used as uh, currency and, and some basic and more ancient cultures. In fact, in some places of the real world, it still happens. A goat, is, a goat might be worth 10 chickens or two sheep or something like that, or a cow is worth uh, five, uh, 10 sheep or five goats or, or whatever it is. Um, and then spices and, and, and herbs were actually, particularly spices, were used as currency uh, sometimes, and they still are in some parts of the world, which is you know really cool. Because again, it, it's, instead of trading a coin, you're just trading spice that's worth at least to that person buying it worth the same thing it doesn't necessarily mean have to be a coin or you know money as we say 
It can be literally a raw thing that you're trading for. And that can be a lot of fun. You can, when your player characters go into the wilderness and they go hunting and they, they skin the bear that they killed or the dire wolf, because um, this happens a lot of my games. I, I like to run a lot of survival stuff and hunting. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, and so you have something you can come sell the the wolf pelt if you want, unless you want to make a garment out of it or something. And even then you could hire the leather worker furrier to make the garment out of it if you don't want to do it yourself. So there's a lot of, again, a lot of role playing, a lot of cool stuff that can be done there or the stag antlers, the big white stag that you felled and you know, you, you're able to harvest its meat to feed everybody on the road for the next three days, but you don't know what to do with the antlers other than them looking cool. So you could probably trade them. You might trade this full, this, this 13 point, Rack, you know, stag rack for a uh, for 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 like ten days of iron rations, maybe uh, dried rations, or for a, a, a wine skin full of the best wine in the realm. There's something like that. So it can be a lot of fun doing the the trade and barter uh, or equivalent thereof. So anyway, getting back to merchants. Um, this is why this is supposed to be about this segment. Uh, so merchants merchants became almost their own class. So that there were people that. Just like everything else, people that specialized in merchant craft and trade, and they kind of knew the market prices and what this one realm or this one tribe needed because they didn't have the resources for, so they would carry them there to, to sell it, obviously, right? Or to trade for it, and they would get what they need either for themselves or as a commodity to go trade somewhere else. And that's kind of how they learned. Uh, so this is where we come up with the term merchant craft or trade craft. Um, and it created like a whole class of its own. Uh, merchants and then eventually the whole merchant thing went into the bank system and stuff like that like the Medici family of, of Italy and uh, the Knights Templar and stuff like that to use real world terms and it even goes back further like the Romans uh, even have proof of like kind of a somewhat bank banking system I know in Savage Kingdoms I don't have it spe specifically like that way but there are the temples of Tytherius, Tytherius is a god of wealth and gold um, and commerce in Laurentia and some parts of Pridonia. And so the temples are uh, used as treasuries. They will actually, the priests have learned to, to hand out loans and stuff. And, you know, they can make a little extra on the top, charging interest and uh, stuff like that. So that can be fun. I try not to get too deep into that because um, I'm a big stickler about keeping, I don't like putting too much modern stuff in it. But the reason I do have it is because it's not entirely modern. It was, you know, there was a primitive sort of banking uh, system and almost like a sort of a uh, credit system that goes all the way back to Rome and even like the latter part of uh, Greece and uh, even some infl uh, even some possibilities that was in China and Egypt as well. So anyway, that's neither here nor there. So merchants uh, and merchants are a good use. You, um, I know most gamers think of doing this like, is there a merchant in town we can go buy something from? Speaking of which, so when people go to buy stuff, they have the shops in town, right? So there, and remember, if it's a small village or small town, there's not going to be tons of specialists. You might have a blacksmith that makes everything metal, not just everything iron. Like you might also work in gold. Uh, he might actually make weapons. They're probably not going to be the best because he's a black, like he's, you know, he's going to only do so much. Uh, and then the bigger towns, you might have a specialist. You might have a silversmith. Or you might have a weaponsmith in addition to just the blacksmith. Um, or even a goldsmith, something like that, or a cooper, which is a coppersmith. Um, so think about cool stuff like that. A merchant would be more like, there's traveling merchants, like those, those are usually the wealthy wealthy ones that come in, they bring these exotic goods into the area, and you trade with them and all that sort of thing. It's all great and glorious. You buy horses and guard dogs, maybe, and, and silk and nice clothing and maybe weapons and uh, maybe jewelry, whatever it is that you're looking for. Um, and then there's the local merchants, which are typically looked at, there could be like a wealthy merchant that might live in this like affluent town, but typically the local merchants on a smaller scale, they are considered vendors or hawkers uh, or peddlers. And these are the guys that just kind of walk around the town. So they're selling like little items. They're kind of fun to role play with because usually they might try to sell you little trinkets that they claim are magical trinkets and they 90% of the chance, they 95% of the chance that they probably aren't. But, you know, maybe there's that small chance and other cool I think that happened in actually one of my kids' games I was running a few weeks ago. I just sort of roll randomly, and uh, uh, so he bought this, like, cheap trinket that it was a bone ring, actually, and just thought, oh, this is cool. It's a ring made out of bone. It actually is. I think he just they found out last session that's actually an enchant literally an enchanted ring. They don't know exactly what it does, but they know it's magical. So that's been kind of fun. 
so yeah so um look at that as opportunity to to trade with with local merchants and also the the big scale traveling merchants and peddlers uh, hawkers and stuff like that and then you know you might even have a beggar um he's, he's he's really like a really low scale peddler really almost just slightly above a beggar maybe uh or maybe it's a traveling performer who's selling his uh his or her performance skills you know a juggler a singer or a lore master almost like a bard who knows all these like cool stories and stuff or storyteller uh or maybe he plays a a, a lyre or a lute or a harp or something so, all right, moving on a little bit more. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about, um, and just a couple more things, really. Common slash rare items is what I put down. I'm trying to cue my memory what I meant by that. Oh, yeah. Um, in Savage Kingdoms, we have, a, we have a thing called item rarity, right? D&D um, &D doesn't really officially use it. I know some people do. I, I do myself when I run D&D because &D, I run it. I try to run it somewhat similar to, to my system, SK. Um, but in Savage Kingdoms, we have common items, uh, uncommon, rare, and exotic. So U, C, R, and E. So, and those are the four categories. So com a common item, I think it's in the, without looking at the book, 80% of the, I think it, in anything that's a large village and up, there's a 90% 90, 90 chance you're going to find anything with a C, with a common. So in the, in these are going to be things like a spear, a tunic, uh, you know, pretty basic, pretty basic stuff, boots. Um, and then you have the next category would be uncommon, which is you. And that, I think, in the book says 40%, uh, maybe, maybe 50, 40 or 50% chance that any of those, any of particular one of those particular items, uh, and you can roll per item uh, or just decide, uh, is at a sizable, like at least a town or, or larger, or maybe even a large village. And then the next item would be uh, rare, which is R in the book, right? Uh, obviously. Uh, so that would be rare things. That is, if I recall, a 15% chance that there's a rare item. It might be 20. I think it's 15 uh, from anything from a large village up to a big, big city. Um, and then also in a big city or metropolis, I think I put it in the book as well, you can skew those percentages up. You can pretty much always assume every any common item is going to be in a large city. Uh, uncommon is probably going to be more like 70%. But rare, so rare is basically a base 15%. And then the last category is exotic, and that is 5%, I recall, so 1 in 20, um, that a, a unique or uh, exotic uh, object is going to be in even like a pretty good-sized city. So that would be really rare stuff, like uh, minor magical items of Savage Kingdoms. Maybe in D&D it might even be like higher magic items, because it's a little bit more high fantasy. Um, or really rare alchemical goods or... Uh, a rare exotic animal for for sale, something like that. So, so it's fun to do uh, rarity categories because again, that gives the players more cool things to deal with and to spend their money on or to trade with. Uh, oh, I've heard of this rare thing, and the, and a lot of my young characters, uh, without even really looking, the players have, they'll be like, you know, hey, is there uh, one kid bought a, a mastiff the other day, like a guard dog, which is really cool. And I deemed that to be rare in this item, and I just, yeah, I rolled for it, and it actually showed up, and it was a fun little role-playing scene, and buying the, the wolf pound, and the the animal trainer was trying to teach him the one command that he taught it, which was attack, of course, so that, or no, or guard, or whatever it was, but, so, yeah, can be fun, so use item categories, uh, if you would, and if you are going to do magic items, I know the Dungeon Master's Guide in D&D says that, you know, well, it's kind of on the fence. Like, there's typically not a thing as a magic shop, but I know in a lot of settings there are, particularly the higher, like Eberron, and I think even in a few places in the Forgotten Realms, a magic shop, which I don't really like that term, is such a massive term. Like, what, why, like, is it spell components and enchantment and potions and just everything? I feel like it would be a little more specialized. Um... Speaking of which, so if you want to ground your fantasy with magic shops, which I do in Savage Kingdoms, you can find places that are quasi-magic shops. But these would be places like apothecaries, where they might have semi-enchanted alchemical goods. Because alchemy, alchemy is considered the eighth magic in Savage Kingdoms uh, lore. Uh, and um, Or uh, a rare herb. There's there's a bunch of rare like semi-magical herbs that grow in uh, Savage Kingdoms, like white lotus and fairy wart and uh borrow weed and stuff like that so so there is a way to put kind of a grounded version of a quote magic shop unquote in there and maybe they might even have a couple of elixirs or potions that they've crafted so maybe the apothecary knows a little bit about some folk magic and is able to craft at least 
uh, like a potion. But I would never, at least in Savage Kingdoms, I would never have anything, no, never have a generic shop that's selling an enchanted sword or like that would be, some noble would have it by now or some pre or it would be hidden in a temple. Like somebody, it wouldn't just be in the shop or it would have been broken into. Um, if if there was a shop that had such a thing and that was advertising that thing, it would be really well guarded. And it would most likely not even be a shop. It would be like this traveling merchant who's very famous and he travels with like a dozen well-armed uh, personal bodyguards and you know, mercenaries and stuff like that. So that might be one way of doing it, which would be really cool. All right, the last thing I want to get to is uh, monetary equivalents. So what I mean by this, these, uh, these are, again, like treasure or reward items. So what could be a monetary equivalent, uh, particularly in a medieval-esque setting? And that's kind of easy to, to answer. So our ancient ancestors uh, were really into oaths and debts back then and the reason they that oath oath taking and oath keeping was such a big deal i mean it kind of is to us in a way you know like hopefully to most of us you like to keep a promise right and a vow but it was probably even more important to uh, medieval and ancient people because there was no we don't like you can't slander people on the internet back then right i mean your reputation could get spread by word which in some ways is even worse because that's more viable more viable more verifiable than the internet um, but they didn't have like a credit system, right? You couldn't check someone's credit. That person's credits, you know, crap is 350 or whatever. I don't want to do business with them. So your credit system was basically your renown, your, your, your reputation. Uh, so if you made an oath, you swore to do something. Most people tried to follow through it because if you didn't do it, you broke the oath. You were, people knew about it and the word spread again, it couldn't spread too far internet like news traveled the, the speed of like a galloping horse for the most part um although in a fantasy setting setting that could also be the speed of a giant eagle maybe or a dragon or something but still point is it's not the speed of electricity um like you know modern data tra uh, travels so people kept their uh for the most part there were you know people still broke oaths and stuff i'm not gonna say that they they didn't because that would be ridiculous or or reneged or try to find a, a loophole in it, you know, stuff that most humans try to do at some point in their lives, just human nature. Um, but try to stay to your promises and vows. So that was a form of, um, uh, of, uh, of monetary equivalent in a way. And so what I'm getting at is that uh, another way to do a monetary equivalent is have someone take a note. Like uh, um, instead of paying you 5,000 gold pieces because I don't have the money, I, I will swear an oath to pay you 50 gold pieces per month for the next three years or whatever for it. I think the math is terrible on that, but, uh, or I will, I, I swear to you that I swear my fealty, I will send my a hundred soldiers to, to your need in the next three days or whatever. So that might be a cool. And, and in fact, these monetary equivalents like that, like debts and oaths can be even more powerful. They're very cool. They can be a lot of fun. Uh, similar to oaths or debts, you know, debts. So you owe someone a debt, like kind of just sort of, so many role played that one right there. Like, oh, I'm afraid I cannot return the debt at this point in time. But know this, at your time in need, I will do blah, blah, blah in the next three months or something. So that's that's a debt, a monetary debt, similar to an oath. Uh, what else do I have? Favors. Uh, so basically I put oaths slash debt slash favors. All kind of the similar thing. So a favor might be like, in the, in the future, I will do a favor of this, which is basically repaying a debt. It's just another word for the most part. Similar would be renown, uh, gaining renown. I know in Savage Kingdoms we actually have a renown system. Well, actually there is in D&D &D as well. It's like an optional thing. It's not used that much. It's mostly for the, uh, what do they call their elite affiliations or their, yeah, those orders and things that you can join in certain settings. Um, but yeah, so renown is kind of a thing. You can become a little more famous and stuff because you, you know, so you've done these cool adventures and these cool battles and these heroic deeds. So we track that in SK and to some degree you can in D&D and other systems. Um, and the last thing I'll go on is a monetary equivalent uh, treasure-wise would be land. Land in the real world, obviously, is a really big deal. Real estate's a huge thing. Uh, most people will argue that land, you know, it tops gold. It's like, it's a piece of the earth and you can, depending on the culture, you can do lots of stuff with that. You can, it's yours. You're the landlord if you own land. Um, there's a bunch, there's some weird little things like, well, technically the government, you know, the government could come and take it. And then there's like little, uh, especially here in Western North Carolina, there's like, uh, there's some like Cherokee land that's itself and it's not really technically part of the U S but it kind of is. So there's all this kind of weird stuff, but 
land was a really cool reward back in the day, quote unquote, but you can also use that in medieval fantasy as well. And I think that gets, I've seen that gets used fairly well. And that's more of like a high level reward. Obviously some first level adventurer killing giant rats down in the tavern cellar is probably, oh, well done. Here's a plot of land, 40 acres for killing the giant rat. So uh, keep it all sort of in balance of what it would be. Uh, similar to that, the last thing, similar to land is titles. Uh, so another treasure reward is being rewarded a title, a title of knighthood, a title of uh, dragon slayer, uh, whatever it is that you can come up with. Um, so titles are, are really cool because they can add to your renown. They can add to, it's a, obviously the main thing is the storytelling. It's really cool. A lot of characters like to have these titles and sure you can like create a character and go i am george the giant slayer and in your background you killed a giant or helped doing it that's awesome it's well and good but if you do it in game and you literally earn the title that's really cool right everybody it, it feels more real right so uh so yeah land renown titles all that stuff um in the real world you you might have been given knighthood um if you weren't born highborn you probably you were like a lower knight like a, a knight banneret uh, or a knight bachelor, meaning that you couldn't afford a wife and you had you know, to do a lot of mercenary work and stuff like that. But you might have owned a small tract of land, and you were and you were expected that you're in a feudal system that your lord above you uh, is given tribute. So if you had a, a forty acres with an or apple orchard on it, you were probably expected to give ten percent of the of the or of the apples to the to the lord above you. So. So the land wasn't just for, it wasn't like, here's the land and I don't care what you do with it, good but day. So it was more like, here's the land, I'm rewarding you, but in the same time, I expect you to develop the land and protect the land uh, from invaders and that stuff. So, all right, I think that's going to do it. It's been like 40 minutes, um, typically longer than I usually, you know, it's always longer than I assume, but hopefully there was some good stuff in there. Been wanting to talk about this for a while. So share, subscribe, and like, and all this stuff. Um, I do these videos less and less because I feel like there's less and less engagement with it. So, you know, it's like, what's the point? But I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just kind of get back into it and see what happens. So, well, thanks for listening. If you made it this far and I will talk to you guys again soon.